You've mentioned enrichment, trying to break this sort of thing. I went straight to big fish like arowana, for example, when they just, because all they can do basically is loops of aquariums. Yeah. Because they have no other option. Yeah. Do you then think it is ethical to keep big ass fish that get way too big in aquariums? Because I would personally think that arowana should not be in aquariums because realistically, personally, most people can't, can't house them, I don't believe, properly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I pretty much agree with that. It's most of these big fish are not being provided with enough. So many people, I, I've seen the excuse quite a few times of, um, oh, you have to keep it in the bear tank because otherwise it injures itself on the decoration and stuff. And I've seen that, that ex kind of excuse and reasoning used quite a few times and it's it kind of baffles me because it's well, they're only injuring themselves on it because it's such a small environment realistically mm -hmm. for the size of the fish that it is and when you look at something like an arowana especially that is a fish that has a specialized morphology specifically designed to jump out of the water to catch things either on branches or in midair its whole physiology is built around being able to coil mm. up into an net and launch itself out of the water. Um, and, well, the added thing with, so with fish jumping, this is just a bit of a side tangent, fish jumping can be used as a cognition measurement. So fish like a hatchet fish, um there's a couple of little marble hatchets in there um mm -hmm. they use jumping as a predator evasion strategy yeah. there isn't a lot of thought that goes into that jump it is just oh shit, there's a, there's something there bang and they just launch themselves out of the water they don't think about it more than just getting out there wow. whereas yeah. something that jumps for predation tactic there's a lot more thought that goes into that because they've got to a know where the prey is b take into account the refraction of the water c then figure out the distance they need to travel so they don't put in too much or too little and miss completely um so it can be used as a bit of a cognition measure as generally the more intelligent fish species are those that are jumping predators um archerfish taking that one up with then having to control jets of water and whatnot as well as mm -hmm. um so something like an arowana um all of those people that say oh just put a kind of a brick on the lid so it can't jump out and then oh look it's jumped hit the lid and broken its spine or suffered head trauma because it's done the thing that it's biologically designed to do you've just got so much kind of such a misunderstanding of that animal that you're trying to deny it the one thing like the main thing that it's designed to do so mm. yeah i very much agree with you that like arowana is that they should not be kept in the general way that most people keep them i think the only ethical way of doing it would be well, A, I'm going to say a tank at least, got to be at least like 20 times the length of the fish in length yeah, and maybe yeah. 10 times in width, mm -hmm. um, something like that. And then having the facilities around that to allow for jumping. So whether that's like kind of some kind of, a bit of a crude comparison but almost like a suicide net like yep. something around so that if it does jump and go out the side it's not going to fall on the floor it needs a safe way of jumping so that it always ends up back in the tank mm -hmm. and it needs big enough space outside of the tank so that it can jump to its full extent and needs to be fed appropriately as well so mm -hmm. that it exercises those muscles um kind of 
and showing the behaviors well, back, back to natural behaviors again showing these naturalist behaviors that it's meant to um and there's so many people that just seem to want to shove a big fish in a big ish tank because it looks cool and there's no thought gone into its its behaviors and what mm. it's what that fish is designed to do essentially about um about 18 months or so ago i went up to auckland here in new zealand I went up to the auckland zoo they just completed a uh, an asian biotope type setup uh, which was phenomenally cool. If you're in New Zealand and you haven't been to the Auckland Zoo, do it. It's worth it. Anyhow, they had a, a group of Asian arowanas there, um, mm. like a big, massive display, clear, perspex glass front, ridiculously deep, ridiculously big. And I think from memory, they had some sort of a, a net on it. I originally thought also people couldn't reach over, grab them and run away with them because obviously they're quite valuable. But it's probably more the jumping aspect now we've been talking about it. Yeah. At the very moment as I was looking at the display, and I was there for a very long time because it was fantastic, I thought to myself, these fish should not be held in captivity in, a, in glass boxes the way that we do. Um, mm. Just watching their behavior, because I'd just recently seen one in a glass box at someone's house, to then seeing them in this huge enclosure, it just opened my mind of this isn't the, we should not be having these. Like, as cool as they are, they it's just not right for the best case. Mm. Yeah, it is, it, if if someone wants to view that kind of, I mean, most people aren't getting it for the behaviour realistically, but if someone does want to view that kind of behaviour, there's so many kind of smaller options. Um, I mean, so I mean, even just look at pantadons, the um, African butterfly. Yeah, thing. cool fish. Realistically, very similar morphology. Mm very similar morphology um even bigger wings so to speak um but they do that there's um oh brilliant example is uh apocylus the golden wonder killifish and yes. their oh, yeah. variant as well which most people don't realize that the golden one isn't the natural one um it's weirdly hard to get hold of the natural one um so they have essentially a third eye on top of their head mm. which is like this motion sensor that means that they can be facing kind of kind of if they're facing that way there is an insect on a branch up here that then falls into the water this third eye then detects the ripples that that's produced and basically tells that fish where where it is and within a split second that fit of, of that little tiny insect landing on the water the golden money killifish is there <laughs> they've kind of know exactly where they are and they're another one which jumps they will figure out where their prey is jump on jump knock it off the branch and then using that ripple figure out where it has landed if they didn't get it in their mouth first try to then catch it and there's quite a lot of different species which do show these kinds of behaviors um which so you can definitely do it on a smaller scale than an arowana that's for sure i even yeah. read a i've not i haven't read it anywhere online but i recently picked up a book from like 1980 i think it was i think it was an axelrod book um and that had a report of um uh hugetta guards the tenoculus hugetta um these little south american kerosens i say little like 25 centimeters um they uh, report them jumping to catch flying insects huh. the amount of, kind of brain power that must go into that of figuring out that um it was amazing but I've, I've not i've never read anything about that online it's just in this book from the 80s oh, wow. um, and yeah um i've also forgotten where i started with that that's um, cool because I've, I've got question after question after question from my original question anyway so we're good 
Um, so in again with the enrichment side of it, and we can talk about arowana because of the size, and this is probably a logical side of it. Mm. And trying not to get into these like I've forgotten the way you said the stereotypical type behavior things. Yeah, stereotypical behaviors, yeah. Stereotypical, yeah. So live foods for me, I've always kind of worked on the theory if the fish doesn't necessarily need live feeder fish then we shouldn't be giving them live feeder fish when i say need there is absolutely some fish that will not take anything but live fish and i get it yeah. but there's some that can be pellet trained yeah. are you aware of any correlation from not feeding them live fish to fish that require that and that kind of behaviors that work with it and where's your standpoint and viewpoint on on that kind of scenario and and live live foods and stuff that was quite a long question. I mean, live foods, when it comes to invertebrates, generally, like, I don't know, like brine shrimp, daphnia, whatnot, that's brilliant enrichment. Yep. Um, when you get to something, like you mentioned, that is like an obligate piscivore, that's when you get some of these slight well there's some slight ethical dilemmas behind it obviously in the uk it's a bit of a legal gray area with whether it is or is not legal to feed live vertebrates in the form of fish to other fish um i i know that there are definitely people that like breed out something stupidly to be like duckies or convicts and then use the fry to like feed to something like a, a South American leaf fish or something like that. Um, it's definitely an interesting ethical dilemma, debate, that kind of thing. I haven't personally kept anything that is an obligate price of all. Um, so that's definitely an interesting one. Um, there's also then, is it Blanophagus? The, there's also some obligate scale eaters as well, mm -hmm. which I've seen people loophole around by buying essentially like a side of salmon from the fishmongers. So they've got it's basically a sheet of scales. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an interesting leopard of Vegas, Rebecca's put it. Um, and yeah, that's an interesting kind of loophole around that that I've seen. Because uh, there's definitely, uh, how do I word this? Sometimes it's impossible to have the true nature thing in your mm -hmm. what they exhibit in the wild in your the habitat that you've created so sometimes you have to make substitutions 